Hi, everybody. Welcome to Busy Living Soba. Busy Living Soba. Busy Living Soba. Today, our guest is Julia. Hi, Julia. Hi, how's it going? It's going well, thank you. And this is different from us because we normally have, or I don't want to say normal because there's no such thing in normal in my world, but we a lot of times have on addicts actually. And this is really cool because we have some, you are actually a neuroscientist. That's right. Yeah. And you, and you yeah. study the brain of alcoholics. Yeah, we, well, in the lab, we study um, the brain and behavior specifically of people who are addicted to a variety of substances of abuse, um, alcohol, cocaine, um, as well as people in recovery, which is what we're focusing on today. And so, yeah, so I kind of hope to share a little bit about all of those different um, things with you and um, any points that can kind of be helpful for people in recovery. Well, I am so excited that you're on and thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. And for those of you that are watching on YouTube, I have to say I got on with Julia and I saw her background and I absolutely love it because it's full of color <laughs> and she has children obviously. And it's just so fun and beautiful. I just love it because it's just, it makes me smile. So tell me this, what is your main focus and what is the recovery and give us a little background of how you guys got started with this. Sure. So um, the program we have ongoing is called the International Quid and Recovery Registry, and it's a program that was started by Dr. Warren Bickle in 2011 through the Addiction Recovery Research Center, and his passion is focused on health behaviors and health behavior change and looking at kind of what um, what psychological behaviors and especially this thing called delayed discounting which we'll get into in a little bit um, what promotes kind of success in addiction recovery and so uh, that's how the quit and recovery registry came about and we're, uh, well, you can locate us first at quitandrecovery.org. And so this last year, this past summer, we revamped the website to make it a little more modern and cool and accessible for, you know, a whole range of people, different ages. And so now we, we offer and we're kind of constantly trying to update different resources throughout the United States, throughout the world, um, different programs that are offering recovery uh, resources, blogs, um, people who are focused on recovery and just getting those resources out to the community. So I think that's a really important aspect. We also have, I, my background is in neuroscience and dance. So I have kind of this um, interest in, in the arts, right? And performing arts. And so we have a section on there featuring um, addiction, addiction recovery, um, stuff related to the arts, movies, music, um, and artists. We actually feature artists who are inspired by addiction and recovery. So um, that's kind of an also a cool piece. Um, we started a Spotify playlist. So along with the science, we were trying to kind of engage the community and just offering them a whole variety of resources. Now, the primary purpose of the Quinn Recovery Registry, and as research scientists, again, we're very interested in the health behaviors that support success in addiction recovery. So what we do is we try to source from the world, and the, the, it's an international registry, so we have people from all over the world join us. And you, uh, to become a member, you would need to be in um, recovery from either substances of abuse, alcohol, any, any kind of drug or a behavior. So you would join us. We ask you a whole variety of questions to assess your background, your history with substance use. Um, it's pretty comprehensive kind of baseline assessment. So we get, get a feel of, of who you are and, and your past history and how you're, how you're feeling currently about um, substances. And then every month you get access to our new questionnaire, our new assessment. And so in doing this, you earn rewards. We try to make it a, a fun base, like point reward system. So you get access to these questionnaires on a monthly basis. And that comes along with our monthly newsletter where we feature different things uh, and highlight different news that's you know, happening in the world about addiction recovery. And then you can take these monthly assessments, earn points, which you can redeem for monetary rewards. Um, and then we as scientists get to kind of study 
all of that data that comes into us. So we have about, the, the membership has kind of varied. We've had at some point 10,000 people, 7,000 people. Um, and on a monthly basis, we get about kind of 500 to 1,000 people engaging with us and, and sharing their monthly information. And one of the cool things about this too is that we can kind of track it over the long term. So look at, we have people in recovery from, you know, as short as one month, two months, three months, all the way out to 10, 20 plus years. So that's really a cool thing too. We get to track this longitudinal assessment. Yeah. And is this a free service? Yeah, yeah, it's a, you know, a free service. Um, we're just kind of looking to help people um, and learn from them. And so you just log on, you become a member. And one of the, all the other cool things about it, and we've been trying to boost this since last summer, and it's, it's gaining um, you know, kind of interest in the community is that we have a, it's kind of like a Facebook or a social media platform for people in addiction recovery. So all our members can log in. And we, we call, when, when people join and become members and you know, they're doing the hard work of recovery, we call them the, the recovery heroes. So I think that's really cool you know, to give them, I don't know, to, to empower them. I mean, it's such, and we can get into the neuroscience of it, but it, it's such hard work. And I, I just have some new data out showing that in people that are in recovery, they, they actually need to have stronger kind of inhibitory control. Their prefrontal cortex really needs to come on board to, to say, no, I'm not going to use those substances. I'm not going to, uh, you know, engage with those behaviors that I used to. So there's this kind of really deep uh, desire and drive motivation for being in recovery. And so that, the, the, the more you can be motivated, um, the more that prefrontal cortex, that executive function is on board, the, that is one of the drivers of success and recovery. Um, and so, so yeah, it, it's really kind of, um, you know, these exciting pieces of information are coming out. And with that um, social media piece, people can get on there, they can, they discuss with one another things that are going on. And for example, like, you know, COVID-19 and all of the racism, everything that's been going on in the country, right? We, it's a, a, people can come and talk about that because these things, these are stressors that are happening in people's lives and they're triggers for substance use, right? So we then, as we, we call ourselves the recovery leaders, we kind of come on, we say, hey, what's going on? Please share what, anything that's happening. What are the stressors in your life? How can we help? And so we kind of make it like a, um, you know, a message board, right, for people to communicate back and forth. So we're trying to build that aspect out, and I think that's really cool. So would you find, I love, I, I actually, at one point, and it, this is a, a couple years ago, I actually interviewed a neuroscientist oh, down at the University of Pennsylvania, okay. and they were studying the brain of alcoholics and addicts. And what they were using as recovery and using rats and that sort of thing. So here we are today in 2020, going on with what's going on in the world. And you studying all what people send in as their questionnaires. Do you find that how are people how are people get finding recovery? What are they using? What do you find is the number one tool at the, of success for people that you have on that come to the site? Where, where, how are they finding success in being able to stay stay off whatever substance that may be, being yeah. heroin, you know, co cocaine, alcohol, weed? You know, I, first I want to ask, like, how many people would you say is it like alcohol versus weed versus yeah, so that's a good question. We have um, a good pr proportion um, of individuals come in um, saying that their past history was either nicotine use or alcohol use um, and marijuana, uh, less so with some of the harder drugs like cocaine and heroin, methamphetamine. However, what is interesting is that a big proportion, and this is you know concomitant with with the what's going on in in the real world, of course, is that there's kind of this co, uh, co addiction, right? Alcohol and other substances. And so a lot of times there's this poly substance drug use, which is, is very common. So, um, yeah. And when, when they come in and, um, uh, kind of, and what we see with the success in, um, staying sober and being able to kind of sustain that long-term recovery, well, 
and I had mentioned this before, this delayed discounting. So it's this idea of valuing the future, future valuation. And I'll talk about some kind of interventions that we use um, to kind of help this kind of thing. But when, when people get into substance use and abuse, the brain changes in all kinds of different ways, right? And these, these substances are very reinforcing and they're reinforcing immediately. Um, for example, if you use cocaine, use any of the alcohol, um, they're high intensity reinforcers that are occurring in the immediate now. And so time and time again, as people continue their use, what happens is that what we call the temporal window um, or their valuation of what, what's interesting to them, what's pertinent to them is the very here and now. They're, they're a very immediate focus, right? Because the drugs, if they're becoming addicted to them, um, you know, what is important is using the drug if they're then in withdrawal reobtaining the drug and you know so it's just very much in the in the day in the week in the month so the temporal window becomes very shortened and what happens is that things that have um are kind of lower reinforcers that need a long-term future look like thinking future lookout like for example family friends education all these things that oh gosh i'm gonna have to you know, spend year, months, years trying to obtain these things, and then the reward will come later, right? They're, they're devalued so that the temporal window becomes very focused on like the here and now, right? Because it's, I, I, need, I need these substances. My brain needs these substances now. I can't um, sustain my next moments without them, right? So that's what you become very focused on. And so um, as a result, when you start getting away from substances, um, you can start kind of looking out more towards the future, right? If you're not so focused on this substance use where you need, need these things in the immediate, then you can kind of open up that, that temporal window. And so what ends up happening is that um, things like family, friends, all, you know, all those things can start coming on board because we start valuing them again. What ends up supporting recovery and that sustained recovery is if you can kind of get on board all those additional aspects of quality of life. And this is a, um, a paper that we're just starting to work on now. So, so those people that are able to maybe get engaged in um, all kinds of things, like an exercise routine, a meditative routine, things that enhance um, your everyday quality of life, right? Um, if you can um, reach out to friends, get in touch with family, because I know a lot of times with, with substance use, a lot of those relationships can be broken or severed, right? So it, it's, it's hard to dig in and, and re-engage, um, probably and most likely when people are engaged in um, things like NA, AA, any of those, you know, a uh, Christian groups, any of those, those groups that can kind of support and enhance the social network and enhance the like um, psychological state, like going to the therapist, right? The, these things sound simple and easy, but they're, they're kind of doing quite profound things. And my focus for, for my PhD work, um, really I studied the effect of exercise on the brain. And so I, I always, you know, had thought about, well, wow, you know, physical activity affects the brain in so many different ways and alters the motivational system um, and enhances all those neurotransmitters that tend to be with drug use, tend to be altered like dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, right? So if you can start to engage behaviors like physical activity, like meditation, that really have profound global effects on brain health, um, I think these things will start to be really important. And, and I know, you know, in, in some um, recovery programs, these things are starting to get in the mix a little bit, um, but more research is needed, right? To like really look at the bolstering effects of all of these adjunct therapies on, um, on cognitive function and, and how it supports uh, recovery. So, so yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things you can do. And I think that probably with anything in, in studying something like um, obesity, diet change, food addictions, these things, you really wanna take a holistic approach. So it's not just one thing, it's not just like, okay, let, let's go to AA and that's gonna be it. It's 
let's go to AA, let's get a therapist on board. Hey, how is my physical activity regimen doing? Can I do anything else? Can I find a meditation app? You know, and the problem is, of course, it's, that's a lot. And, and for somebody coming out of, um, a, from long-term addiction, right, that, that might seem impossible. And so starting, starting small, trying to get one thing on board um, and making small goals. This is our other thing is that with, um, and, and I'll talk about this thing, it's called episodic future thinking. So episodic future thinking is this really cool intervention that we have ongoing in the lab that has shown real promise for kind of basically enhancing the engagement in the health behaviors. And this, this speaks back to kind of that, that broadening of the temporal window. So ep what episodic future thinking is basically is just um, thinking about your future. We, we have them in the lab generate these positive cues about their future. So for example, um, I'll generate a cue. I'll say, okay, in three months, and it's a present tense thing, in three months, um, I'm going to be um, at the beach with my family, with my husband and kids, um, enjoying a really nice day with healthy food and um, just having a fantastic time. So if that were my cue, then um, what we do in the lab, we actually send them these cues. They generate this out from three months out to 25 years. Um, so we get you thinking about your future in the, the far distant, right? But positively imagining these things. And then we, we send these cues to you um, throughout the day, like three times a day. And so you think about your future, you, you know, try to enjoy thinking about your future, and then you go about your day. You um, go and eat breakfast, you go and eat lunch, you do whatever you're gonna do. Um, yeah. Wait, so not to interrupt, but so what you're trying to say is that, so, so the person comes up with a goal. So they say, all right, this is my goal in three months. In three months, I want to be sitting on an idyllic beach. I want to be with my family. I want to be with my partner. And I want, so that's where I want to be in three months. So we're in September, let's say September. So that's where I'm going to be. I'm going to be in some place idyllic. And mm -hmm. then you spent, that. you guys send for three, each day you send three inspirations. Let's call them inspirations. Inspirations, love it, okay. yeah. Okay, so inspiration, so that you are going to keep that goal as like something you want to go to rather than going and picking up that drink, the drug, or whatever. Is that what I'm... Exactly, exactly. And so uh, this has, it, it really, it works. It engages those when we talk about why this is working, you know, it's, I talked about that prefrontal cortex, the hippocampus, these, these future oriented um, executive function, long-term planning parts of our, it engages those parts of our brain that are for those things, right? Rather than our quick, I want my drink, I want, you know, my drugs. So it engages areas of the brain that are needed to control and inhibit the need to take a drink. So what we're trying to do is get those brain areas on board that say, okay, I'm interested in the future. I value my future. I value my life. I'm interested in whatever it is, three months, 25 years from now. And that's going to help me engage in the healthy choice. And so the fact that, you know, we, we're doing it periodically throughout the day, several times a day um, to try to, to enhance healthy behaviors and it, and it works and, it, and it's been shown to help reductions in cigarette smoking and drink consumption, drug use. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's a plan and, we, and also a food consumption for individuals who are overweight and obese. And so, um, yeah, it's a pretty powerful tool um, and that, that we're really excited and, about, yeah. And that is free? So I mean, in the in the in our laboratory studies, it is, and we're kind of okay. working towards getting, you know, possibly an app or something, right? The the simple health behavior. I mean, it's something that you can just sure, it's free. Like do it do it for yourself, right? Like right. it's something that you can engage in on a whim. Um, but yeah, in the laboratory, you know, you sign up for our studies, and then sure, it's it's free, and you get paid, and and all that. But um, yeah, it's a really interesting tool that's that's just so simple. Um, and yeah, yeah, I kind of love it. I love that because it tends to be that the, and what I have found and, um, just my opinion is that, you know, a lot of times the alcoholic brain tends to go to negative very quickly yes. and hence 
that you know forget it i'm a loser and the self the the in that inner voice to, critic seems to be very negative so nobody loves me nobody cares about me you touched on the family aspect mm -hmm. and my family's not going to let me back they're never going to forgive me i've done deplorable things and then I, there's no way i'm going to be able to have this future forget it i'm just done how am I ever going to get this? Like to even think three months from now is really, as you mentioned as well, because it is that instant gratification that the addict just loves, right? Exactly. Exactly. And so the, the cues, like you mentioned, family and so forth, the cues can be tuned to whatever it is you want it to be. So you could say, in three months, you know, I'm going to be talking on the phone with my sister and we're going to be having such great conversations. Our relationship is going to be healed and I can't wait for it, you know, something like that. So, um, the, you know, the positivity kind of engaging in that positive, um, attitude really, really helps so much. Um, one of the things when I was at NYU, we, uh, my, my mentor there on uh, Dr. Wendy Suzuki, she does a workout called Intensati. And we, had, we hadn't applied it to um, addiction recovery, but I think, you know, I'm always very curious about applying these things um, to, especially physical activities, to addiction recovery. And, and what this particular workout was, was you were doing your physical activities, say your punches or, you know, your lunges, whatever it was, but everything was paired with a positive mantra. So you would say, you know, I am great. I am good. I am worth it. Today is fantastic. Um, and so I thought that was so cool. So it, it's kind of that, um, in that same vein, right? It's starting to change those, um, those cognitions from negative ones to positive ones. Um, and I know that's a very important therapeutic tool, right? Just are thinking positively because all of those thoughts influence how we feel, our emotions, our, our physicality, you know, even our posturing and, and so forth. So, um, yeah, so that's another good point. I love that because there is so much to be said for one with the mantra because you're saying it over and over and over again. You know, Louise Hay, do you know who Louise Hay is? She was from years ago. She was, so she would say, she did this thing called mirror work where you would go and you'd look in the mirror and rather saying, you know, oh my God, you look in the mirror and you see something negative, you say, oh, I love Elizabeth. I love her soul. I love what she is on the inside rather than on the outside. So let me ask you this. So personally, how did you get in? What, is there a reason why you wanted to study the alcoholic brain or recovery? Is there, do you have a personal stake at this? Yeah, so I, you know, addiction of course is, is so prevalent in everywhere. And as in many families, it runs in my family. Um, and I would say that probably for the past 20 or so years, um, I've been dealing with family members that um, have either had um, an uncle die of alcoholism and a cousin die of drug addiction and other very close family members just be involved in opioid crisis and all of it. So I've, see, I've seen that firsthand. Um, and, you know, when I was in college, I um, just was, was interested. I, I, I was a dancer all my life. And, um, but then, you know, and I, my dad is a physician, my mom's a nurse. So I was always kind of in science and, um, wanted to to do something but then neuroscience uh my my boyfriend at the time had had a, a traumatic brain injury um a frontal lobe aneurysm and so kind of got started getting very interested in neuroscience and then this interconnection i double majored in dance and neuroscience so kind of this interconnection between the body and brain started to emerge and um when i joined my phd program i went to a lecture on uh, motivation, reward, and drug addiction. And this thing just kind of hooked me, you know, and all the, all the pieces were kind of coming together. And so, um, yeah, I just kind of continued in my trajectory. And now I'm a senior research associate at Virginia Tech. And um, Dr. Bickle had an opening in, in his laboratory to um, really dig into this work in humans. And so that's where I landed. And um, he, uh, you know, gave me the opportunity to, to be part of this IQRR and get it going. And so um, it's just kind of been a journey. So it's both personal and then kind of just how, how my career trajectory um, landed with that, that first uh, lecture in my PhD seminars. 
and uh, yeah, so so it has it has been a journey, but one that I'm really interested in, and my kind of my piece in it really being interested in the the body brain connection and knowing that we can use our bodies to engage in all kinds of healthy behaviors and that they have these really cool effects and potent effects on the brain. So um, that's where my personal research will be heading. Yeah. So neat. We're so lucky to have you studying our brain, giving us more information because <laughs> we always need resources so that we can get better and better ourselves. Because yeah. for so long, there were only a finite things that you could go to when you were an alcoholic or an addict. And you're like, how am I going to get better? And 12 step is great, but I don't think it's the end all be all, unfortunately, mm -hmm. right? It's not, there's not one, one certain magic thing that you can do that will fix all. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do agree. And I think that the research is showing that really kind of a holistic approach to the whole thing. It's like, you know, you need to, it's not just, just going to your one therapy session once off, once a month or whatever, right? It's, it's being committed to a healthy lifestyle, you know, and that includes like the diet, the exercise, the like getting yourself ready in the morning, um, reaching out to family and friends, trying to have like whole social connections. So um, yeah, so, it, you know, that recovery is a journey and, you know, we, we also talk about and, and allow and open up the conversation for relapse because that's a part of the, of the recovery journey. Right. Yeah. And we, we, in the lab, we have conversations about, you know, what, what does recovery mean? And, and if you have, you know, a glass of wine or two, or, you know, enjoy an evening um, with an alcoholic beverage, does that mean that you've relapsed, you know? Um, and so uh, we, we think that the answer is, is no, that, you know, it, it, it's not a failure, right? It's kind of a, a progression, a journey, the, as long as the slope is going upward, um, and that, you know, it's not the the um, the abstinence kind of model um, might not work for everybody, right? Um, you've probably heard from a lot of different people that have maybe had a whole different slew of things, right? So the the um, the definition of recovery, I think, is emerging. Um, the research is showing, and that um, you know the fact that you do ha fall back, have a drink, or have a night. Um, of use doesn't mean that that there's failure, um, that there's still these progressive changes. Um, and when we look at at the brain and how the brain's changing, you know, the longer that the that you have time in recovery, um, you know, Nora Vokal was doing all the work right at NIH showing at at NIDA showing that um, you know it's about a year past a year where these brain changes start to come on board um, in key reward circuitry areas, especially um, like the, the dopamine, the, the trans transmitter is kind of coming back on board, um, everything getting re-regulated to look like the healthy brain, right? The healthy non-use brain. So it does take time. Um, that first, those first few months, the first year, I mean, you just need to be sensitive with yourself right you're you're in a process of healing and i think that that's okay right it's it's a disease it's a brain disease and so there's going to be a process of of healing growth recovery um physical actual physical brain recovery right um and then you know after that once the brain systems can start re-regulating um once the the neurotransmitter systems are kind of back on board then other health behaviors can kind of start coming online. You can start engaging with these things. So um, there, there's a time period where there might be like, you know, rest and sensitivity. And um, I, I think that's, that's an important thing too. You know, it doesn't have to be everything all at once. It's, it's an emergent process. Do you find that a lot of the people that reach out to you that are in recovery, are they, have they used 12 step or what would you say most people are using that come to you? Yeah, I think it's it's either a lot of twelve step, and sometimes people just say they've they've done their own program or you know done it on their own or just cold turkey and and whatnot. Uh, because I I know that a lot of people find that twelve step you know not for them. Um, so you know, but it's hard because there's not that many options, and so I think people are interested in the IQR too because. Well, it's a different thing. And people have, have emailed me and asked like, well, what is the IQR? Is it a 12 step thing? No, it's not a 12 step thing. And it's not a, 
you know, it's not a formal recovery program either. We're kind of interested in gaining information about the behaviors that support successful recovery. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I think there's probably up, there's other options um, beyond beyond the the 12 step, but the research is not there yet. And so the fact that the 12 step is there and in place, it's kind of like our only only thing, right? Like, um, and then, you know, I, I've personally gone to, to some of the, um, the meetings for um, those, you know, family in recovery. And, you know, when I went, I, I had gone to a, um, a session at an addiction recovery center um, for a family member. And, you know, I, one of the coolest things I thought was they, they had the, the addict member say, okay, what are all your ailments, physical, mental, blah, blah, blah. They listed them all, you know, different, different members. And then they had the, the family say, okay, now how many of you are having chronic pain? How many of you are having sleep problems? How, so, you know, these, these things are shared. It's in the family and, um, you know, it's a really a healing process for, for the group, for the, the family dynamic. And so, um, yeah, yeah, I'm hoping that our research and then, you know, others researching this and what recovery means, because people had so long focused on addiction, you know, and now this, there's this emerging science of recovery. I think it will help to enhance the programs available for, for recovery. So you're just like an added bonus. If somebody's out there, they're doing it on their own, they don't wanna feel alone, they can sign up, go on board and just have another resource at their, their disposable, disposal. Exactly. Just exactly. Like exercise, eating right. healthy, exactly. doing, if you are coming off heroin, if you have to do naltrexone, Vivitrol, whatever, whatever, you know, um, if you're taking a placebo effect, whatever it may be that's yep. helping you to stay off this, this is just another tool to add to your toolbox. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Another tool to add to your toolbox. I like that. Yeah, yeah, because so many people are out there and they're like, okay, here I am. I, I'm sick and tired of picking up whatever this is. My life isn't what I want it to look like. Mm -hmm. right. I can't have those dreams like you were talking about in the beginning. I can't have that long lasting you know, what is it going to look like in three months? Cause I don't even know what it's going to look like in three hours. Right. You know, and, and I, so ideally what, what every recovering addict needs is kind of a, a, you know, it's like, ideally you would want a personalized um, session. We, for example, for some of our studies with obesity, um, we, we act as the case managers and we customize a specialized eating plan for them. We teach them about exercise and offer them different exercise programs. Um, in some new studies I'm gonna be doing, we're gonna design some meditation mindfulness programs. Um, so we're really trying to take like a holistic approach to the thing and customize it because, you know, some people hate exercise and some people hate high intensity, right? Interval training and all of this stuff. So to really um, have like a, in, I mean, individualized, personalized medicine is ideally where this thing, thing is heading in the future. Um, but I mean, it, it takes, um, I think probably the greatest success in, in addiction recovery will be this holistic approach where, where all of these things are tackled and having an, an individualized um, trainer, case manager um, would, be, would be ideal. So it's some of these programs that we're trying to implement in the lab right now, at least, that then later maybe become um, what will be offered, what will be available. Well, because, you know, busy living sober is all about getting busy living sober today. It's get, about getting busy living in the moment. I mean, it came awesome. about because it's not, because there was, there's so much shame associated yeah. with addiction. Right. right. And so this is about not worrying about the shame of yesterday and living in today and getting busy living sober today with the tools we've just talked about today. Yeah. That's awesome. I love it. Yeah. You know, and, and that, that's true because, you know, especially a lot of the behaviors associated with addiction are sitting in your room, sitting in a dark room, sleeping most of the day, right? Watching TV, engaging in these kind of sedentary behaviors. And so it, it's, it's so true. Getting busy, being sober is really important. And it's all about that future thinking and getting these healthy behaviors on board, getting busy, engaging in your healthy behaviors, you know, it's what it's all about. Yeah. 
Well, I thank you so much for coming on today, Julia. I appreciate well, it so you. much. And thank you for your efforts because it's like, I love this tool. I think that if somebody's out there and they're like, I want inspiration every day, they've got to go to your website because it sounds amazing. Just to have that reminder three times a day saying, you know, look, in three months, if you go, don't eat that, you know, don't eat the Big Mac instead of <laughs> the salad, you can oh, have it happen, right? Don't right. pick up that drink because God forbid you get a DUI and now you're now all that money that was going to the beach is going to lawyers. You know, it's just so many right. things. So just having a different, uh, you know, a different way of looking at life is just what it's all about. Well, I appreciate yeah. you so, so much for coming oh, on. Thank you. I and um, good you. luck with all of your research and with thank your little you. ones. I love your playroom. <laughs> 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 all right, everybody. Until next time, keep remember to keep getting busy living sober. Bye-bye.